ancient African art, which was once classified merely as naive and primitive, has come to be accepted by the great artistic masters of the world as works of art, created by people of exceptional artistic capacities. This documentary film will as much as possible treat African art from both the artistic and archaeological perspective. Evidence of civilization traces back as far as the 8,000-year-old Dufuna Kano with the most sophisticated design of its time, discovered in present-day Borno State. Similarly, the terracotta art of the Nok people reveal an advanced culture thriving in the area now called Kaduna State. Nok sculptures, Nok terracottas, they are mostly terracottas. They are the oldest sculptures in Africa south of the Sahara and they go as far back as 2,500 years ago and at the time before Christ was born a lot of people in this country which was not Nigeria then were busy making these art traditions and also we found them at their peak before the Europeans ever set foot on West African soil, the territory that makes up present-day Nigeria was dominated by independent empire and city-states. From the Great Khan and Bornu Empire, which expanded through long-distance trade and military technology, to the Igbo Kuo civilization, the first bronze casters in Africa who source materials from as far away as Egypt. The Igbo Uku Museum, being run by the Anambra State Ministry of Youth, Sports and Culture, is one of the few museums owned by state government in Nigeria. Like other repositories across the country, Igbo Uku Museum has lots of stories to tell about the Igbo people of Nigeria. We take a look at the ancient artifacts in the Igbo Uku Museum of Southeastern Nigeria. Now, some of these artifacts represent an ancient cultural tradition of bronze making by the Igbos, long before the Benin and Ife bronzes came into existence. The museum's artifacts are highly traditional and they serve different purposes in the social religious affairs of the Igbos. Igbo Uku, a town in the southeastern Nigerian state of Anambra, is notable for three archaeological sites where bronze artifacts from a highly sophisticated bronze metal working culture dating back to the 9th and 10th centuries was found during excavations. These artifacts are believed to have existed long before other known bronze artifacts such as Ife bronze in Oshun state and Benin bronze in Edo state. The head of Ife is three quarters life size and named after the town of Ile Ife in Nigeria, where it was dug up nearly 70 years ago. It's hollow and made of leaded brass about a centimeter thick. The head wears a crown that was originally painted red. Over the centuries, the once shining brass face has taken on a natural green patina. The head of Ife is thought to be as much as 800 years old. It's casting at a very high level. It's a very beautiful object. It's ancient, it's enigmatic. In the whole African tradition of art as we know it, it has a certain uniqueness. There isn't very much else like that. Um, it's, it's just a very, a very powerful, mysterious object that, that one is drawn to again and again. The Benin bronzes stunned Europeans who saw them. People worried long and hard about the Benin bronzes. Could they really have been made by Africans? Were they actually made by Portuguese for them? Uh, we now know, of course, that they were made by Africans, and that casting tradition stretches back long, long before European influence. But at the time, they changed, very importantly, our preconceptions about what African art was and what Africans were like. But the people who made these majestic sculptures, dating from the 16th to the 19th century, were relative newcomers in the art and craft of casting metal. 
Their oral traditions told them that they had learned their skills from the Yoruba people of Ife, about a hundred miles away to the northwest. In fact, this Benin bronze of a man on horseback has been interpreted as a metalsmith from Ife, bringing the knowledge of casting techniques to the people of Benin. Came in the early years of the 20th century, a German anthropologist, Leo Frobenius, led an expedition to West Africa and visited Ife. For a few weeks in 1910, Frobenius carried out excavations and unearthed many terracotta and stone heads. But he was also shown a brass head, which he was told was Olokun, the Yoruba god of the sea. He photographed it for his book, The Voice of Africa. It bears a striking resemblance to the head of Ife in the British Museum. Closer to me is the cast of the head which uh, Leo Frobenius was shown in 1910, uh, which is called the Olokun head. And the second is the original head, which is in the British Museum. As you can see, both heads are done according to the same aesthetic traditions. The treatment of, of the face, uh, the nose, the lips are made in the same way. The treatment of the, the ethnic marks are the same also on the, on the face. They indicate the same tradition of producing brass heads. The sight of the brass Olokun head threw Leo Frobenius into a state of utter confusion. He simply couldn't believe that the people of Ife had ever been capable of making such a sophisticated object. In 1910, it was generally thought that African sculpture was extremely unrealistic, uh, savage heads, the sort of thing that Picasso was inspired by. That was thought to be the way Africans carved. Um, and to find uh, in Ife a head which rivaled in accomplishment the finest naturalism of the Greek Elgin marbles or whatever, was a huge surprise. And people thought, well, that's not how Africans carved. Uh, uh, Africans don't make naturalistic sculpture. Naturalism is the high point of civilization, and they refuse to believe that Africans themselves did this. Frobenius came up with a novel suggestion to explain the existence of the sculptures he discovered in Ife. Frobenius said, well, it must be that this was a, a, a Greek civilization, and even went so far as to say that uh, it was proof that Atlantis existed, and this was the remains of a Greek colony of however many centuries earlier than that. It was at the end of the 19th century that Europeans first began to take a serious interest in the art of Africa. In 1897, over 2,000 works of art were removed from Benin City in Nigeria after the city was destroyed by British troops. And today, the treasure of Benin is dispersed among museums and collections all over the world, in Britain and America, Germany, Russia, Switzerland, Sweden, France and Australia. The second biggest collection is now back in Nigeria, but none of the objects have returned to the place from which they were taken, the Palace of the Oba of Benin. Reminders of the quality craftsmanship once commissioned by the king now lie in Benin City Museum. These are, sadly, mostly replicas of bronzes that were taken from here in 1897. But even so, I'm struck once again by the intricacy of these objects. It's always the detail that shocks me when I look at these Benin plaques. I mean, the whole thing is very much like a historical document, as much as a piece of art. I mean, this is depicting very particular people, and you can imagine them in all of their finery, because it's see, you can see it actually depicted here, the detail of the textiles, the layered textiles that they're wearing. Many bronzes depict 16th century obas, and they are records of specific events, such as military victories which expanded the kingdom. This, for me, will be oba essigy returning from 
fighting the Agala triumphant with his retinue. Oba Esagi bolstered the kingdom with the help of the Portuguese, who provided weapons and mercenaries for battles. Many of the plaques were made during his reign. The Portuguese also brought the metal, which enabled the bronze casters to immortalize. Most of what we think of as African art today are the types of abstract art and wooden art that really influenced uh, 20th century artists like Picasso. So to see these objects that are made in a very classical way, more like Greece and Rome, I think it's a revelation and I think it changes your idea of what African art was. One example is this statue of a beaded woman called Adina. This early stone sculpture dates from the 9th century and it represents Adina, the gatekeeper who presided over and protected uh, the sacred grove at Orate. The Adina statue is seen in a gatekeeper's position with, wearing a large beaded necklace and beaded bracelets. Ife was, the wealth of Ife was due to a bead making tradition. They exported their glass beads uh, north to the north of Africa and made this area very prosperous. Marzio says her favorite works in the exhibition are the metal sculptures of human heads. From the 9th to the 14th century, this area created a number of copper alloy heads that are unlike anything else you've ever seen in African art. They have wonderful naturalism. They look as if they could speak or communicate with you, yet they have the realism of Roman portraits. Most of these works date from a period a century before the art of metal sculpture returned to Europe during the Renaissance. Marzio says they show a level of skill similar to that attained by the ancient Greeks and Romans. A good deal of Ife art has been found by accident. In the dry season of 38-39, they were digging out the foundations for a house in the area behind the king's palace, and they found 17 cast brass heads and a half figure. This sensational and unexpected new find was reported with great enthusiasm by an American anthropologist, William Bascom for the Illustrated London News. Such was the high quality of the work that he likened the unknown people who made them to the great Italian Renaissance sculptor, Donatello. He wrote, little that Italy, Greece or Egypt ever produced could be finer and the appeal of their beauty is immediate and universal. Most of the heads unearthed in 1938 remained with the Oni of Ife. These are casts of some of them held in the British Museum collection. The sight of such a large group of refined naturalistic work had a profound effect on Europeans. But the idea still persisted that they couldn't be the work of Africans. In his article, William Bascom wrote, how in a comparatively obscure corner of this vast and backward continent could an art and a technique have flowered that take their stand beside the best ever evolved by the elaborate civilizations of Europe and Asia? You know, old stereotypes die hard. And in spite of the discoveries of Frobenius in 1910, and in spite of the then in brass castings from 1897, people still had this view of African art as schematic wood sculpture, rather jagged and angular and sort of unlifelike and all the rest of it. So placed in the context of African art, this head had the effect of forcing Europeans to expand their view of what could be considered art in Africa. This is a very fine bronze head very similar to those that are on display in the exhibition uh, of the Ife heads. This is a, made by a process known as hollow loss wax casting. In that the first stage is to make a core of clay that will occupy the space inside. When that has been done and moulded 
what one does then is coat it with wax. So put on wax to the thickness that you require. Then what the next stage is to add is to actually do the important bit, the artwork. In other words, to carve the wax to the face. So in other words, you'll wind up with a wax looking exactly like this with the clay core, solid clay core inside. At this stage, you then add pouring channels down which the metal will flow and you have some other channels once again in wax the next stage then is to actually apply the very fine clay very carefully to the outside to the thing to create a negative mold the next stage then is to invert it and put it in the furnace so that the wax can run out so you've now got a hollow space where the wax was. You then put that at a higher temperature and run in the molten brass and let the whole thing cool down. Take away the mold casing and there is your head. The, the overwhelming visual quality of those heads is their naturalism and idealised naturalism. In other words, Ife has made us expand our view of what is truly African. For some time, all the good things which were dis discovered in Africa was believed not to, be, to have been made by Africans. Uh, fortunately, we have moved far away from, from that. If we consider the time when this was made in Europe, it is still Middle Age. And the aesthetics of these heads are even far beyond many things which were produced in Europe at that time. Perhaps future excavations in Ife will reveal more brass sculptures and provide more evidence that adds to our knowledge of the civilization that created them. Till then, we can only admire a small masterpiece that helped to change European assumptions about African antiquity. South from Ife and near the coast, there flourished the ancient city and empire of Benin. This old print, following a Dutchman's visit in about 1620, shows the king of Benin riding out to receive the plaudits of his people. Benin artists, beginning at least as early as 1400, had long been developing their own styles and techniques, styles that were entirely African in inspiration and execution. They have their place today among the artistic masterpieces of the world. The Benin sculptures are fascinating enough in isolation. But when you put them together in a museum, you add a whole new layer of meaning. The French know better than most what a difference a display can make. As the new millennium dawned, Paris awaited the arrival of a new museum. It so happens that the French museums with ethno large ethnographic collections, essentially the Musée de l'Homme and the Musée des Arts Océaniens et Africains, uh, were somewhat uh, deserted by the public. Nobody really knew much what to do with these collections anymore. Jacques Chirac wanted to bring all of France's collections of works from other civilizations together. The idea was to create a brand new cultural institution. Jacques Chirac had high aspirations to combat Western ethnocentrism, to hold collections in trust for all mankind, 
and to contribute to positive dialogue between cultures and civilizations. To an art historian, it's a piece of historical evidence. It's also an aesthetic object to be appreciated in and of itself. But to an anthropologist, it's an artifact which is valuable because it sheds light on another culture and a different way of life. The museum, Quai Branly, opened in 2006. Its bold architecture was calculated to attract attention. But it was what lay inside the building that was under the closest scrutiny. Back. Running down the left-hand side of the exhibition is a collection of bronze plaques. Ces plaques en bronze, elles sont Elles sont tout à fait étonnantes à différents niveaux parce que d'abord ce sont des, des, des formes d'œuvres qui sont tout à fait uniques en Afrique où on ne pratique pas ce genre de, de, de bas-relief. That's an artistic point. But the plaques also contain anthropological information. Ces plaques font l'apologie de de l'Oba, mais aussi de ses dignitaires, d'un certain nombre de, de rituels, d'un certain nombre d'actions qui sont véritablement une archive euh, historique de, qui vient se superposer, s'additionner à l'archive euh, orale, puisqu'il n'y a pas d'écriture. In Paris, the plaques are given a special status by the design of the exhibition itself. This is the traditional setting in the palace where you have the Oba at the middle, surrounded by his chiefs. On the few occasions that the Oba left his palace, his sacred body had to be protected from the rays of the sun by the shields of his chiefs. His attendants, going before him, carry leather caskets, containing kola nuts for the Oba to distribute as a gesture of patronage, just as he does today at the daily Imaton ceremony. One of the most technically accomplished of all the plaques, a masterpiece of bronze caster's art in high relief. It shows the Oba fulfilling his sacred duties by sacrificing a cow. The roof of the palace at that time was surmounted by a huge bronze bird. Below it, a great python, also of bronze, sprawls down over the wooden shingles. The pillars supporting the roof were covered with plaques, and the entrance to the palace was permanently guarded by warriors. One Oba was said to be able to raise an army of 100,000 men within 24 hours. Many plaques record their victories. This is a prisoner with a brutal sword wound across his chest. The scars on this man's face show him to be an Igbo from one of the tribes to the east of Benin with whom the Bini had many wars. When this plaque was made, the Portuguese had been in touch with the kingdom for something like a century, and they too appear on the plaques. They're shown with such accuracy that it's possible to date them from the details of their clothing. This man must have been in Benin in the early 16th century. He's armed with an elegant sword, but the Portuguese had more advanced and effective weapons than that. They brought cannons and muskets, the first guns that the Bini had seen, and they had crossbows. The Oba persuaded them to join his army, and with them on his side, he became one of the most powerful rulers in West Africa, conquering an empire that stretched for 200 miles along the coast from the frontier of present-day Dahomey to the banks of the Niger River. The Portuguese were seeking ivory, pepper, and above all, slaves. They oversupplied them, and in exchange obtained metal. One of the attendants waiting on this chief carries what was to become the standard currency on the coast, a European-made ingot of bronze, a manila. And metal from overseas is still eagerly sought after today. Facing the line of plaques are the themed collections of other exhibits. These items complement what you can see in the plaques themselves. This plaque shows three African traders. They're holding manilas, the currency that was used for trade with Europe. 
The next plaque along shows their Portuguese trading partners. And they're not short of a manila or two. But look to the right-hand side of the exhibition and you'll see real manilas. This cross-referencing bridges the gap between art and anthropology. On a pas choisi une exposition qui soit anthropologique ou esthétique ou, ou artistique parce que je crois que, et ça c'était aussi une des grandes euh, politiques du, du musée du Quai Branly, c'est de pouvoir euh, avoir euh, des approches euh, complémentaires. But some observers believe the art historians have the upper hand. This salt cellar is presented as an object to be admired, not just explained. It's been given an aesthetic value that reaches beyond its historical context. This leopard can be seen as a piece of art. But originally, it was used for carrying water. Seeing it purely as a sculpture could strip it of its meaning within the culture where it was created. Or, vous voyez que, par exemple, à chaque objet, vous avez quand même un, un ensemble de, de 6 à 7 lignes qui, est, qui donne des informations précises sur, sur, chacun, des, sur chacun des objets. Et, mais que cette information ne soit pas en, en très gros, mais soit disponible et laisse au, au regard le, le plaisir de, de pouvoir regarder des, des formes et de pouvoir les admirer, je pense qu'il y a un équilibre possible entre les deux. People are not used to seeing their cultural patrimony exhibited in ways in which it's valued, uh, made uh, uh, sort of uh, made to appear as really valuable works of art and so on, which they are. On a quand même une culture africaine, et cette culture africaine, elle se met au même niveau, elle est au même niveau que certaines euh, que certains arts de certains certaines cours européennes 16e, 17e, elle a la même puissance et euh, c'est là où je veux dire que on peut tout à fait relativiser ce qui s'est passé en Europe. Many French still assume that they have this vision of African cultures as essentially tribal, relatively unhierarchical, relatively without a centralized power and so showing Benin is a good way also of rectifying or correcting this uh, skewed view of African cultures in the, in the French public. No file has altered the delicate contours of this image. Until the end of the 16th century, metal was in such short supply that the craftsmen were extremely sparing with it. The bronze of the earliest pieces is of eggshell thinness, and the delicacy with which the original wax was modelled and covered in clay was so great that little filing was necessary. So the disciplines imposed by a scarcity of metal contributed to the development of a style which surely represents one of the high watermarks of sculptural inspiration in all Africa. European experts might argue about the origin of this superb technique, but to the Bini, there is no mystery. Their traditions state that it was taught to them by bronze casters from the sacred city of Ife, to which the kings of Benin paid homage. But no one in Ife today casts bronzes, and there's little solid evidence that anyone ever did, until in 1938, digging the foundations for his house, a man discovered 18 superb bronze heads. They were lying close to the palace of the king, the One of Ife. According to an Ife tradition, the god king in ancient times was ritually murdered after reigning for seven years. It was dangerous, perhaps, to allow the body of a god to age like a mortal man's, for it might risk the failing of the land's fertility. These noble, life-sized heads were probably displayed during the funeral rituals, wearing the royal crown as symbols of the immortality of divine kingship. Archaeological evidence suggests that these bronzes were made several centuries before the Portuguese arrival in West Africa, perhaps as early as the 12th century. So wherever else the tradition has its roots, it's not in 15th century Portugal. But were they also the inspiration for the bronzes of Benin? There is more than tribal tradition to link the two. This little figure was dug up in the palace in Benin. 
but from the regalia on its chest, it can be recognized as an image of the Oni of Ife in full ceremonial robes. And exactly the same regalia is modeled on one of the bronzes that was found in Ife itself. This ivory armlet places the king where he belonged in Benin society at the center of all things. Plaques in brass, which once adorned the walls of the Orba's palace, reinforce the power and mystery of the king. A visitor from Holland to the King of Benin in about 1600 wrote this report. The city is composed of 30 main streets, very straight and wide. The houses are arranged in good order. The people are in no way inferior to the Dutch in cleanliness. Their houses are as polished as a looking glass. They have good laws and efficient police and show us a thousand marks of friendship. Orba, king of men, could handle leopards, the kings of the forest, like toys. From his waist sprang mudfish, symbols of power over sea and river, whose guardian was Olicum, archangel of the waters. The king had great authority, but this depended on the support of noblemen and appointed chiefs, and on certain persons of ritual power. Among these were the queen mothers of Benin, one of whom is shown in this memorable head, sculpted in about 1550. Adjoining Benin was the ancient empire of the Yoruba people, with its heart in the city of Oyo. The Yoruba developed great military strength based on cavalry. In matters of state, the King of Oyo had to consult his council, the Oyo Macy. If the council were united against him, the king was in trouble. In theory, he was supreme, whether in religious affairs or secular matters. But if he lost the confidence of the Oyo Macy, he could even face death. Such was the authority of the council that if they turned against him, the king might have to commit suicide. So kingly power in old Africa was a two-edged sword and rulers had to use it with care. When at last Europeans reached these shores, they came at first in peace, as traders or ambassadors asking favors. The king could grant trading permits, which he did in return for handsome gifts. Great deference was shown by these European visitors, and many accounts speak with admiration of the splendor of African kings, their courts, and their palaces. The cities, too, were large and impressive enough to command European respect. <laughs> 